networks have been described as residing between markets and hierarchies. So what does that mean? So initially we talked about exchange relationships. So that's purchasing goods and services on an open market, right? Remember our price was our adversarial nature. And at the other end, we've just talked about vertical integration and these multi-divisional forms of organization that control all of the means of production. So between these two sort of extremes on a continuum reside network forms of organizations. So these are a number of different firms that each produce different products and services, but are interrelated to produce one amazing product that then is delivered to customers. So a, a key sort of body of literature emerged around the idea of networks. Again, as I mentioned, you know, 1970s, 80s. Um, in 1986, a theorist by the name of Thorelli uh, wrote an article essentially called Networks Between Markets and Hierarchies. And a lot of the information that I'm gonna share with you today was based on Thorelli's work. So he was what we would call really a seminal theorist that developed one of the first articles that outlined some of the fundamental principles of networks that differentiated them from markets and hierarchies. There are three fundamental building blocks of network analysis. So the first one, well, when we think about a network, we think about it as a series of nodes and those nodes are all organizations that are linked to one another. So we look at the nodes and then critically, it's what is the type of relationship between those nodes. And that's why we've been talking about exchanges, partnerships, alliances, and vertical integration, right? So within that networks and all of those nodes that are interacting and linked in various ways, you know, what is the strength of those ties? Are they a whole bunch of partnerships? Are there exchange relationships? Are there alliances in there? Is there some vertical integration? Okay, so, so those relationships are really key. The second attribute um, is the nodes themselves. The third one is the configuration of the network. And there, what we're really looking at is centrality. There are three fundamental building blocks in network analysis. The first one is the nodes or the actors in the network. The second is the relationships that link those nodes together. And the third is the configuration of the network itself. So the nodes or the organizations in the network generally each uh, produce something different that adds value to the network overall. The nodes are continually changing. Remember we talked about um, the sport industry as being an ecosystem. So as that ecosystem continues to evolve, we see nodes coming and going within the context of that network. The second key part of looking at a network and understanding it is the relationship between the nodes or the linkages between the organizations. So, so far we've talked about exchange relationships, partnerships, and alliances. So when we look at a constellation of nodes or organizations in a network, you know, how are they linked together? Are they strong linkages? Are there a series of alliances between these organizations? Are they more partnerships? You know, uh, how many of those exchange relationships exist? And the third element that's critical is configuration. And here, the most important element we're looking at is centrality. So we're looking at which organizations in the network are the most central. Network analysis explores the structure of relationships among actors in a network and the location of those actors. And of course, this has importance for the behavioral, perceptional, and attitudinal consequences for both the individual units, and that's those nodes or organizations, and for the system or the network as a whole. So centrality is one of the fundamental building blocks of a network. So what we're doing there is looking at the location of different organizations in the network 
and, and which ones have the most ties. So the most central actor is the actor that is linked to the most other actors within the context of a network. So the most centralized network that we could have would be a hub and spoke where you have one central actor that's linked to maybe 20 or 30 other actors. Importantly, the other actors are not linked to each other. They're only linked to the central node. In a network that is not highly centralized, where we have a number of different organizations in the network that are linked to one another, this speaks to the level of system coupling in, in the network. So that means how many organizations in the network are actually linked to all of the other or a few of the other actors in the network. So in a highly dense network, we'd see a lot of ties between organizations. Now this doesn't mean that we don't have some central organizations that stand out and have more links to others, um, but it does mean that there's a high proliferation of linkages, so a lot of communication that's going on between different actors in the network. There are other networks that are have a very they're very loosely coupled, and that means there's a low degree of system coupling, where you might have maybe one or two central actors and some linkages between other organizations in the network, but not a lot of linkages. So very critically, when you've established the level of centralization, is there one central actor or several, a few different central actors that have lots of ties? And then you look at the degree of coupling, so how many organizations are linked to others in the network. The other key factor you need to consider is the actual strength of those ties. So the weakest tie that organizations can have is a link where you're simply sharing information. A stronger tie, of course, would move on to those partnerships that we've talked about and those strategic alliances. And so within the context of the network, understanding the dynamics of that network and where the power rests means looking at who is central and how strong are the ties between those central actors and the other nodes in the network. If you're the central actor and you're linked to other very strong organizations through, say, a series of strategic alliances, that means you have more power in the network. You have more information, you have more access to resources, you have more ability to reach out and link to other organizations in the network. So let's envision a network where um, a smaller organization is not a central node, but you're linked to an organization that is linked to a central node. That means potentially that you can gain access to the power by networking, by strengthening the ties that you have with your existing links, and then gaining more access to information, resources, etc., through those ties that you might have. So if you're an organization that's located at the periphery of the network, then you need to overcome that position by networking and developing re stronger relationships with the nodes that you're already linked to. Again, trying to reach out to that central node that has all of the power or most of the power within the context of that network. Noak and Kuklinski, 1991, describe a network uh, through its relations that exist among actors linked within a network that again are those building blocks of network analysis. By looking at the patterns of strong and weak ties and the changes in the relationships between the actors, we can gain insight into the overall structure of the network. When we talk about a partnership or an alliance, we're looking at a dyadic relationship between two or more organizations. Not to say that a partnership couldn't involve three organizations or more, but essentially you're really looking at it from that dual perspective. 
when we adopt a network perspective, we're really getting an enhanced view of the overall dynamics of the relationships between those organizations. So that context is really critical to the interaction, uh, to the opportunities for um, uh, increased access to information or resources or innovation um, or advancing a network through product creation by exchanging um, personnel or technology between different partners who are within the context of that, that network. We're getting some insight into the sources of power in the network because we have that visual view so the network perspective gives us a real sense of power in the network because we're able to look at a visual of the network and understand where those central actors are. Um, it gives us a sense of the inter-firm relationships um, where we go back to are they exchanges, partnerships, alliances, but also those norms, expectations, that governance uh, that goes on between the organizations in terms of the expectations um, that are commonly held among those who are linked within the network. Um, and then certainly the what they call the logics of action, the dominant sets of ideas and beliefs that guide the, the strategic thinking, the actions, the resources, the focus on innovation or, or the, what really is driving that network to be a leading edge focus within the context of an industry. Now that you know the fundamental concepts of network analysis, I'm going to share with you a bit of a story of some research that uh, I really had the honor to undertake with uh, Professor Martha Barnes of RECL and Dr. Joanne McLean, um, who at the time was with uh, SPEMA, and she's uh, off in glorious British Columbia right now. So we were very fortunate to receive one of the first uh, Sport Canada grants. Um, to undertake research on network analysis and we decided to try to understand the swimming and basketball networks in Niagara. So this type of research had really never been done at the community sport level before. Um, but what we did was we contacted the expert in network analysis, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Keith Proven, um, who had uh, very prolific, had published tons of research on network analysis and used a program called UCNET 6 um, to analyze his data. And sometimes professors can be very proprietary about their surveys or their methods because obviously they don't want you out publishing them, um, which is very sad, right? Because we're all supposed to be working together. Needless to say, uh, Dr. Proven was not like that at all. He was amazing. He actually sent us his survey. Um, so we modified his survey. So he had really done health networks, so community health, so really looking at uh, referrals. So if you went into a doctor's office or a clinic or an eye doctor or whatever, what did that referral network look like? Well, of course, we were looking at sport organizations and we wanted to know, did they collaborate you know, to market their organizations or cross market their organizations together? Did they share information? Um, did they apply for uh, grants? Did they offer, pro joint program delivery. So we weren't really sure what the interaction would be like because this was inductive research, right? It had never been done before and we didn't really know what to expect. Um, so we chose swimming and basketball. One's a team sport, one largely individual sport, one indoor, one outdoor. Um, one largely run by obviously swimming pools um, by public organizations and the other by nonprofit uh, community sport organizations. Um, but yet again, they're still delivering community sport programs. So the actual product that they were delivering was the same. And so we started out with basketball and um, what we did was got a list together of all of the basketball organizations in Niagara very key to network analysis is you have to have a hundred percent participation of the different organizations in the network. So at first we sent, we mailed it, I think, no, we actually um, had a clinic. We had um, 
Basketball Ontario come in. We invited all of the basketball clubs to come in for a free clinic. And then after the clinic, we asked them to fill out our survey. So this was how important it was for us to, to get them all to complete the survey. So anybody that didn't complete the survey, that didn't come out to our clinic, we then followed up with them. Um, and then if worse came to worse, we basically phoned them and did it like a phone survey because we had to ensure that we had 100% participation. Um, so swimming was a little bit easier. Um, they had a sort of a collaborative group um, that met uh, quarterly. And so what we did was, you know, attend one of their meetings. Um, and usually they had about a 70, 80 or 80 percent um, attendance rate at their meetings. And so we went to one of the meetings that had people actually complete the survey at the meeting. Um, so that was terrific. But long and short of it was uh, it took us a few months to make sure that we did have a 100 percent response rate um, from all of the swimming clubs in Niagara. Niagara um, and basketball and for swimming we also looked at Brock and we looked at private swimming providers so that might be someone that might have a private backyard pool and they're offering swimming lessons or it might be one of the hotels or the wave pools in Niagara um, that uses lifeguards and is part of that swimming uh, could potentially be part of that swimming network in um, Niagara so uh, our results were really quite uh, astounding um, and and uh, so over the next couple of minutes um, we'll be sharing some of the maps um, that compare uh, the information sort of all of the ties together um, what the map looked like um, but I'll just start by saying that um, there was very little, little collaboration and integration and network ties density in basketball whatsoever to the point where we could really hardly even identify a central actor other than it looked like the referees association um, because everybody needed to have referees but there wasn't sort of a, a set of even um, smaller more centralized organizations because there were virtually so few ties in basketball um, and uh, and what we saw in some of our maps was a number of basketball clubs that weren't connected at all other than to um, the referees and some of them didn't weren't even connected to the referees and and what we did was call those a series of isolates um, that were should have been part of that network but really weren't connected at all so that was our first study a um, little bit surprising by the results um, and then we did swimming and we found almost the complete opposite where there were no isolates that virtually every organization in the network was linked to the other organizations even if it was just to share information and so we were looking at two sets of community sport providers that had virtually completely opposite or or very divergent networks when we actually were looking at these linkages and and trying to understand a little bit about uh, centrality or who was linked to who and why they were linked or in the case of basketball um, the big question was why they weren't linked so that was the first part of our study was to do these surveys um, but as you can see <laughs> when we looked at our network maps that we you know Martha Barnes carefully inputted all the data into UCNet um, you know we really came out with way more questions than answers from the research that we've done so far so we decided that we needed to do interviews well, we had actually already planned to do interviews but they became even more important so we sat down with the basketball providers and asked very straightforward questions about who they about basketball did they have any partners who are they linked to why were they or weren't they linked to different uh, organizations how they felt about partnerships or linkages generally you know how they attained resources for their uh, organizations and what we found was that there was this overriding sense in basketball that the different basketball clubs in the Niagara region were worried that the other clubs would steal their best athletes and and so they were really competing with each other to secure the top 
basketball players, um, both uh, male and female athletes. And there had actually been some clubs that, that used to be one club, and then there were politics um, over how to run the club, and then they separated into two separate clubs. And so those clubs completely refused to have anything whatsoever to do with each other. And, and so, and of course, this was really very evident in our maps. And I'll just give you one example um, that uh, as part of another research um, project that we were doing, we ended up interviewing one of these uh, heads of one of these basketball clubs. And he told us a story about how they um, had secured the opportunity to do raptor ball. So when the raptors came to Toronto, they wanted everybody, of course, to purchase all the merchandise, go to the games, etc. They're trying to sell tickets. And so in communities around Ontario, you could buy into to raptor ball. But there were certain, you know, manuals, uh, you know, I guess obviously memorabilia, you would get actual, you know, basketballs that had the raptors logos on them, all kinds of things. Um, and one of the core fundamental principles in the Raptor Ball manual was that you were not allowed to keep score for children under the age of 10. Okay, fundamental principle of Raptor Ball, no scorekeeping. It's supposed to be fun. It's skill development at that age. And so when we were speaking to this one gentleman, he told us a story about how they had Raptor Ball and then a gentleman came down from the Raptors to actually watch the program, right? They're giving them money, all these resources, etc. cetera. Um, their brand, the Raptors brand, is on this, this community sport club's, um, you know, program. And, uh, and the person from the Raptors said, you know, uh, you're not supposed to be keeping score. So they were keeping score for the kids who were like, you know, six, seven years old. And, and of course, very lopsided. The kids are different heights, uh, different skill levels, um, and uh, not very much fun for the kids when they're losing by 30 uh, points in a match. Um, and so the gentleman from the Toronto Raptors said, um, you know, we really want you to change that up if you're gonna be using our brand and we want you to stop keeping score. And the gentleman who was the head of this basketball club said no. And it was kind of like, we know more than you do about our basketball and our kids and our program. And so we are gonna, we are gonna get rid of, Ras ba of Raptor Ball. And they did. So, so there was this mindset. And, and again, we're, we're trying to understand this. Imagine the expertise that the Raptors put into developing that program. They would have worked with Canada Basketball to do that. They would have worked with the NBA to do that. You would think that they would know how to develop basketball players if you're part of the Raptors. So we went to Ontario Basketball and we relayed this story because we really was this fundamental you know, thought of how does this happen? And, and we met with the executive director of uh, actually Canada Basketball and Ontario Basketball. And they told us that within community sport clubs, and I don't think they were speaking exclusively about basketball about this, um, but certainly basketball would be included, that they, ca they called it the king of the castle syndrome. Okay, and I will make this gender neutral. It could be the queen of the castle <laughs> syndrome. But the idea is that they are so confident in their decision making, being the head of the board, or having created or started this basketball organization, that they really do not want to network or receive information or collaborate um, or risk influence with any other organization. And, and Canada Basketball and Ontario Basketball had specifically developed a series of policies to try to change that mentality in basketball. And, and yet they were unable to do so um, because of the resistance of the, the local clubs. Um, so that gave us, and, and obviously there were a lot, there were interviews done with every club, um, so we had a lot of other insights, but that gives you a little bit of a snapshot for basketball that helped us to explain why there were very little collaboration and integration. And, and you'll see from the network maps on, on marketing or fundraising or shared marketing or the overall ties in the network, you know, why we see very um, loosely coupled uh, networks in basketball. So when it came to swimming, as I mentioned, we saw a lot of collaboration. And so we were really, you know, this is exciting, you know, and, and after the basketball stories, we really wanted to know what were the triggers? 
what happened within the context of swimming in Niagara that you know facilitated this tremendous amount of, of collaboration and interaction among the swimming organizations. And we were told that uh, years ago, you know, they didn't used to be like that, that they used to be a lot like basketball. And this time they weren't competing over the athletes, the swimmers, they were competing over the lifeguards. Okay, so um, one pool might offer, you know, the bronze medallion, someone else would offer the bronze cross, the next pool, a uh, young person might go and do their NLS. And then wherever they did their NLS, that pool would offer them a job and they would take that job. So even though the other pools had contributed to the development and certification of these lifeguards, they weren't actually able to hire them. And so one summer came and they weren't gonna be able to open any outdoor pools or wave pools or any pools in Niagara because they did not have enough lifeguards. And it was a crisis. And the only way that they were gonna get over the crisis was to have all of them work together. So what they did was they decided to increase the number of courses that they were offering for lifeguards and then pool the opportunity to recruit those lifeguards across all of the different swimming pools. Okay, and then I don't think they had any type of collusion around wages or anything like that. So they worked together to resolve the crisis. And once they began to work together, they realized that they could um, offer numerous programs through joint promotion, through fundraising, through um, and, and particularly fundraising around awareness of swimming. And obviously if children are taking swimming lessons and you live in the Niagara region where we have the river and the lake and Shirkton uh, uh, Park and, and lots of uh, areas to swim, um, there were lots of reasons that um, brought these people together to collaborate, not only around lifeguards, but for these other reasons as well. So again, two different networks, two completely different um, outcomes, um, and two very different yet interesting stories. The stories that I've just told about basketball and swimming really highlight the fundamental reasons why organizations would partner generally, right? To gain access to resources, knowledge, uh, innovation opportunities, funding, right? So very similar. Um, and, and barriers are clearly those, you know, fear factors around loss of control. So when we think about networks of organizations, think back to what we learned about partnership earlier, right? Why organizations would link to begin with. And then what you're doing is generalizing that to a whole network of organizations that then interact together um, or not um, in the case of uh, basketball. Um, but certainly there are benefits to, uh, this is the clear benefit from taking a network approach to understanding collaboration and integration. Having this pictorial view, these, these actual um, you know, maps that we can look at to understand the nature of collaboration and integration among organizations and then following up with the interviews to actually understand you know, why those maps look the way they do. We're gonna take a few minutes to talk about industrial districts, which are, you know, from my perspective, like a network on steroids. So think about Silicon Valley. Think about a geographically bounded area where organizations in the same industry reside and compete, and yet they all are, they're all proximal to one another. Why is that? Why would all of these organizations gravitate to the same region? So we've had a Silicon Valley in Ottawa, we've had one certainly in California, and yet we've seen other industries. So there's leather making in Italy, there's automobiles in um, manufacturing in Britain, right? So what we've seen over time are the growth of these geographically bounded uh, industries that are highly successful and highly competitive. So we're just going to take a few minutes and, and look at why these industrial districts are so successful. Michael Porter refers to the advantage created by these industrial districts, these geographically bounded, highly successful, highly competitive 
uh, industries as this sort of a diamond um, notion of competitive advantage where you have certain critical elements that all exist within that region um, of a country or of a province um, and uh, so here we'll just give you an example so in addition to having several companies that are competing in the same industry you would also have a favorable government that might give you tax breaks, etc., um, that supports your industry in order to, to facilitate hiring and jobs and innovation. Um, but the key part there is that those those government that government involvement brings in the competitors, but the competitors are rivals. Right, so they are trying to continually innovate, continually do better than the other organizations. And in doing that, they then attract other suppliers in, as we would say, a network, right? Another partner, an ally that they need to be linked to in order to create the best products or services that they can. So if it's automobile, here in Niagara, you know, we have the wine industry, we have Brock University, another key element that, that Porter identifies as part of this diamond model of competitive advantage where the university has the viticulture, and then we have the wine industry, and then we have the top wine restaurants, and people come from all over the world to try our wine, and of course they're sold all around the world. And then we get instant feedback from the interplay between the people who are eating and drinking the food and the wine and the people who are making the wine and Brock University, the students that are studying and innovating and then of course the, the actual vineyards that are making the wine and hopefully innovating in terms of the best way to maximize uh, the fruit that we have in, in obviously our really great uh, wine region of uh, Niagara. Um, so the idea is that these firms are, are they're competing, but it's not a hostile means of competition where they're trying to put the others out of business, right? They're just trying to maximize the benefits by leveraging partnerships and innovation, um, by linking up with a university or bringing in a new partner into the region. Um, there are related and supporting industries. So in Niagara, the wine industry is very closely tied to the restaurant industry. And then we also have our other industries like, you know, one example would be the grape escape, right? Those cycle through the vineyard tours that are, attract people to come to Niagara. They visit the different vineyards and then provide feedback about, you know, what they like or don't like about the wine. And of course, hopefully they're buying wine and, and then cycling uh, <laughs> around the streets of Niagara on the lake um, there's an investment from the government in in skills and capital um, and infrastructure so whatever it is that's needed in the region so if we needed a huge capital expenditure here in Niagara to enhance our wine or winery um, businesses, the, the local governments would likely do that, right? Because they want to facilitate the growth because this industry hires so many people. Um, again, this notion of customers coming into the region are sophisticated and demanding. So we have people come from all over the world to test Niagara's wines and give us feedback. And of course we get feedback as our wines are sold globally as well through the LCBO. So we, there's a unique uh, um, supply set of supply and demand conditions that create this infrastructure where organizations that compete are actually benefiting from interacting together because of the educational institution, the government, the supporting industries, um, and the supply and demand um, uh, pressures um, that are geographically located in the same area. So an industrial district is typically made of small to medium sized firms that interact together within um, a, a relatively dense set of network ties that's supported by the government and by educational institutions. Um, the, and this evolves over time to enhance the products and services that everybody in the region supplies. So I mentioned the cycle through the vineyard, the Grape Escape, that tour company. 
right? So even though that would be ancillary to the core um, grape and wine industry, it brings in people who are part of that demand market that give feedback on the product or service. So this is what's unique. This is what creates this, this network of ties that goes beyond just the network perspective, our swimming and our basketball, right? Here we're looking at this highly interactive, highly successful network that again, brings about not only competitive businesses, but world-class businesses that enables Niagara to compete on the world stage in terms of the wines that are produced in this region. At the beginning of this segment on networks, we talked about the work of Thorelli, and, and he had that, that notion of the make or buy decision or the decision of from markets to hierarchies, right? So the open market where you can just go out and purchase something, remember adversarial price, and then the hierarchy being the vertically integrated organization. And he really told us the benefits of the network approach right in terms of you know you don't have to be as part of a big multi m form organization of a hierarchy but you don't have to have the risk of being out on the open market at the end of the day all of you are graduating in a few months you're going to be out in the workforce and you're going to be managing resource acquisition for your sport organization on an ongoing basis. If you're not making the decision, you're actually managing the relationship that your organization already has. This is gonna be fundamental to your success in your job that you're going to have. So Thorelli and others have provided us with 11 criteria that you can use to make the decision of whether to buy on the open market, to vertically integrate, or to operate within the confines of a network. So over the next couple of minutes, I'm gonna go over those 11 criteria. Um, and some of them might need a little bit of elaboration or explanation, um, and, uh, and I'll try to define those terms for you as we go along. The first factor that you need to consider in what we're calling the make or buy decision is asset specificity. Asset specificity is the need of your organization for a unique, a rare, an inimitable, um, or a very valued resource that is critical to the overall success of your organization in relation to your customers, right? So your customers need to have this rare element um, and your organization needs to be able to have access to that. If that's the case, you may want to vertically integrate. The second factor is the availability of the asset on the open market. So if it's widely available, then your organization is in a monopsony position, and that means you have all the bargaining power, right? There's literally hundreds of organizations selling the resource that you need. You may as well bargain and get the best price, right? So that's the second factor. The third factor is the importance of the asset to the overall success of your organization. So like asset specificity, if it's fundamental to the success of your organization, then you might want to look at vertically integrating and or, you know, potentially it could be a strategic alliance, a very strong, enduring, long-term relationship that enables you to even develop or enhance that resource even more than you otherwise would, but you wouldn't want to look at a partnership and certainly not the open market. So the fourth is uncertainty in the market. So what if there's an element, and we'll, let's just say lithium for batteries. So you need batteries for your product, you have to have access to lithium, but because of uncertainty in the marketplace, because of the value of the resource, uh, maybe um, channel, uh, supply channel um, issues, right? So maybe you wanna own that, maybe you need to vertically integrate that. Unless you can secure that, through an alliance um, or potentially um, you, you could go to a partnership, but you know, really doing an assessment of the uncertainty of the marketplace and the absolute, you know, the, and again, that would tie back into the value of that product to your organization. Number five is frequency of use. 
If it's something that you're going to use all the time, you don't want to be out in the open market looking for that and having to negotiate for the price, right? Either buy it or get in a long-term uh, partner relationship where you can have guaranteed access to a resource that you're going to need to use over and over again. Number six, price right so how much is it going to cost you to make it yourself versus how much is it going to cost you to buy it on the open market easy there if it's lower to for you to actually make that yourself by vertically integrating then vertically integrate so number seven is related it's the actual cost of the resources there are some resources like legitimacy or a brand that you cannot buy right that associate that apple brand that coke brand you need to ally with those organizations if you need access to that brand and or an organization's legitimacy its network of partners all of those inimitable um, assets of the organization that no matter how much money you have you simply can't buy that um, so there we would call that um, the um, cost of the resource um, but what we're essentially saying is that there are some resources that you simply can't buy number eight is the quality threshold and the important thing that you're looking at here is what quality is expected by your consumers so if you're selling Gucci bags, then you need a tannery or a leather that's of a very, very high quality. So if you cannot be guaranteed that you can access the quality of the resource that you need that's demanded by your customer, then you may need to vertically integrate or enter into a very strong, a strategic alliance, a very strong relationship that guarantees that you'll have continued access to that high quality product. Some people cheat, some people steal, some people lie, some people will go behind your back. Some people will tell you that they're selling you the best product ever and when they're actually using really subpar um, ingredients that go into that product. We call that moral hazard or opportunism. All organizations are subject to either internally, people that work for you, right, and are shirking. And I think, you know, we've seen those pictures of people that are working and they're actually sleeping, right? So these issues confront organizations. So can you trust your supplier? Are they, are you going to pay for the highest price because you think you're getting the best product when they're actually giving you some quality ingredients? So if you cannot control for moral hazard, or bound or, or this idea of opportunism then you will may need to vertically integrate but you really don't want to have to do that okay so you can have a contract you can have penalties you can monitor you can go to their plant and look at the, the ingredients that they're actually putting into your products and services you can uh, check out their reputation before you buy from them right so there's lots of ways that you can manage opportunism so there you know in terms of that make or buy decision you could probably set up a pretty tight contract with the help of a lawyer and and go into some type of a partnership or an alliance um, but Open market, you're very vulnerable, of course, to, um, to opportunism. You don't necessarily need to ver vertically integrate because of it. So you're in the middle of somewhere. Organizations can't collude. <laughs> in Canada, it's called the Competitions Act. In the US, it's called the Sherman Act. Okay, that means that organizations can't get together and price fix, right? Or s artificially restrain salaries, which uh, Major League Baseball did uh, when Peter Uberoth was the commissioner, right? So all organizations have to follow the governance of the particular laws of their region, their province, their state, their national federal government, okay? So when we talk about our alliances, right, and we talk about networks of organizations, you need to make sure at the same time that you're not being collusive in the activities that you're undertaking. Competitive, absolutely. Collusive, no. So if it gets to the point where you need to dominate because of price in order to compete Pete, and that's certainly one of the avenues that um, is suggested by Michael Porter, then you may need to vertically integrate, right? You may need to buy all the gas stations in a particular region so you can just set the prices yourself, right? Um, or as MLSE, you know, set the prices by owning 
horizontally integrating all of those franchises and then setting the prices accordingly okay but make sure that if you are collaborating that you're not colluding and our final one is overcoming bounded rationality so all of us don't have perfect information we can't possibly know all of the information around the globe that's going to affect our business. And I think right now the fact that I'm at home filming this lecture instead of with you is a good example of that. Who knew that COVID-19 would basically shut down all of sport for an entire season or virtually all of a season? So because of bounded rationality, organizations need to be somewhat nimble right you don't want to get locked into contracts you don't want to be heavily vertically integrated and then find imagine mlsc right now that owns all those venues that are empty imagine if they also own the sports stores inside those venues that are no longer selling jerseys right how many people you know can't get raptors tv right now right so they've got that huge in capital investment and yet they don't have any revenues coming in right now so you know thinking about the 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 fact that our ultimately our information is bounded no matter how much research you do you can read the newspapers you can forecast you can live on bnn uh, my husband <laughs> um and and try to get as much information about markets as you possibly can and products and innovation but at the end of the day we don't know what's around the corner your employer is just going to love you because you've just got the keys to the industry on decision making of the most important decisions that your business is going to make. How do you access the resources that you need to compete and not just compete to win, right? To be the best organization in your industry. So follow those 11 key ingredients, those recipes of success um, that surround that make or buy decision when you go into the workforce.